All right. Hey, here we are. Oh, I probably shouldn't be too loud. Okay, so um, it's a little chilly out here, so I'm going to get started right away. It's getting dark, um, and we are at the trap. We are at the trap, chapter 21. Let's get there. Let's see what it says. Chapter 21, the quarry. All right, so um, we're going to set that trap and see if, uh, well, Chef do Chef setting that trap with Nikonk and see if Mara falls for it. I hope she doesn't because then it's gonna get bad. Okay, so here we go. Chapter 21, The Quarry. Darkness lay thick next night about a certain warehouse on the riverfront in eastern Thebes. Some distance away from it at the water's edge, a yellow glow of torchlight spilled across the wharfs from the decks of the friend of the winds, which lay close in against the dock to receive her cargo. Okay, so remember they said, there's all this uh, gold that's going to go to Friend of the Wind. They told Mara, Nakon told Mara, and uh, in front of other people. The reason they did it in front of other people, because Mara could go and tell Nahira, hey, they're, they're putting all their gold on the Friend of the Wind. And then Nahira goes and, and his soldiers uh, aboard the ship and get everything. Um, then she can say, well, it wasn't me. There were other people there. It could have been them. Because if it was just her, then she wouldn't, she wouldn't do it if she were guilty. So... Let's keep going. They were still loading her. Figures moved against the light, humpbacked with burdens as they filled up the gangplank, as they filed up the gangplank and across the deck. There were the usual thumpings and slammings and bellowed orders above the lighted decks, the tall black masts swaying gently against the stars. Beyond the dark length of the river, wound away southward, splashed with gold here and there, wherever a torch burned. In the gloom beside the warehouse wall, screened by a pile of fish nets and old lumber, Nakonk heaved a heavy sigh of impatience and tried for the 50th time to get comfortable on the coil of damp rope he was sitting on. Sheftu, a dim blur in the shadows beside him, seemed not to have moved for an hour. The captain wondered bitterly if he had fallen asleep. For all the anxiety Lord Sheftu exhibited, one would think he had come here merely for a breath of air. As for Nikonk, it had been the longest day he had ever known, and he made it rough weather of it, alternating between bellowing ill temper and silent worry until by mid-afternoon every man in his crew was keeping a wary eye on him, and his own nerves were taut as a straining hawser. He felt even more tense now, lurking here like a keft at the edge of darkness. So they're just watching the boat, the friend of the wind, and if the soldiers come, then they're going to believe that Mara was guilty of telling somebody, whoever her master was. The captain eased his shoulders back against the rough wall and tried to make his mind a blank. The reek of fish and hemp and rotting wood rose strong about him inside the warehouse. He could hear the loud scratching and scrabbling of a rat. Beyond the edge of a pile of nets, burdened figures moved monotonously back and forth in the torchlight from the dock to the friend of the wind. Nakon found himself automatically checking her trim. Overloaded on that port side, he muttered with gloomy satisfaction. Cargo master's a fool. Sheftu's voice came out of the shadows, cool and ironic. It scarcely matters, does it? Of course it matters. They'll have to shift half of those bales before they're well into the current. What do you mean it scarcely? I mean they'll likely not be sailing. Nikonk abandoned the subject, shifting his position once again and cursing irritably at the prickling roughness of the rope. Patience, Captain, soothed the other. It cannot be long now. By all the gods, is he even human, thought Nikonk. Do you care not for what happens to the maid? He got no answer, but Sheftu's voice was a little less smooth when he spoke again. You tied the boat to where I told you to. Aye, in the papyrus at the far end of the wharf, it's ready. They were silent again. After a time, the conch twisted around to scan the black mouths of the alley, still quiet and deserted, then squinted up at the stars. By the beard of Ta, it 
if it isn't the mark of eight by this time, I'm no river man. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was supposed to be Nakon. By the beard of Ta. If it isn't the mark of eight by this time, I'm no river man. He stood up, checked the alley one by one, then sized up the stack of bales on the dock. Mate, they've all but finished loading. Look yonder. I'll wager a sail to a shinty. The hour's eight or past. He stood clenching his fist to keep them from trembling. It should happen now. It should have happened already, if it was to happen. He realized Sheftu had risen too and was standing stiff and erect at his side, scarcely breathing. Still, the minutes crept past. The commonplace sounds of loading went on. By Ammon, she's won, thought Naklonk at last. She didn't take our cursed bait. All's well. He opened his mouth to blurt it out and felt Chef to seize his arm. Captain, look. A light shone in the mouth of one of the alleys. Nakonk tried to blink it out of sight, pretend that it was moving the other way, but it came on brighter and nearer, accompanied by pounding footsteps. A knot of soldiers burst out onto the wharfs and with more, than their, uh, with more at their heels, they were regulars in green helmets. There was a shout of surprise from the loaders, a roar that answered it. In the name of the queen, the next moment, the night was alive with running men and with torches and glinting blades and con a confusion of yells as the raiders poured across the wharf and up the gangplank of Friend of the Wind. The conch dug both fists into his forehead to shut out the sight. Name of Ammon. She's only a child, he thought. A waif, after all, who's not seen but ill luck all her life and needs a friend and a chance. So be it, I've seen enough, said Sheftu quietly. Nakonk had seldom in his life been afraid of anyone, but he was afraid now of the tall young man who stood beside him. Mate, he whispered hoarsely, let me do it. I'll find her. I'll have her out of Thebes tonight. I swear by... You'll follow orders, Captain. Sheftu flung him a look that left nothing but obedience in, in the conch's mind. Come to the boat. He slipped out of their hiding place, and the conch followed. They plunged down the lane beside the warehouse into the next dim street, and then along it, parallel to the river, at a pace that left the captain no time to think or even feel. His mind had gone numb in any case. He knew they were making for the hidden boat, that they would cross the Nile and lie in wait for Mara somewhere on the other side, intercepting her as she was starting for the inn. He knew what was to happen in some dark alley and that he could not prevent its happening. But it all seemed unreal, a nightmare from which he could not wake. They swerved back toward the river. A few minutes later, Nakonk was dragging the boat from the concealing papyrus stalks, still moving like an automaton. Cast off the painter. I have a paddle there somewhere. They pushed off across the black water, and with the familiar rocking motion, the feel of the paddle in his hand, Nakonk's numbness began to wear off. He pulled harder and more fiercely, so that the boat shot like a live thing through the current but the exertion, the exertion failed to stop his thoughts. Bear to your left, Captain, said Chef to at last. We'll make for that statue on the bank. The fishing punt was there, moored to the great, uh, to the great granite toe, as always, An old ank dozed nearby. Chef to nudged him away, none too gently, flipped him a debon and ordered him home, then hurried up the bank. She's a cold-blooded little traitor, Nakonk told himself desperately as he, try, as he tied their own boat and hurried to follow. Did she give a thought to you when she decided to turn informer or even to Sheftu? She's earned what's coming. She'd have run the whole plot underground, aground if she could. Just don't think. Don't look at her. Remember, don't look at her. This will serve, said Sheftu coolly. I believe she's coming. Nikonk emerged abruptly from his preoccupation. They stood in an alley, a head up its murky narrow length. He could just make out a slender cloak swathed figure hurrying through the shadows. Nikonk wet his lips and glanced around him, wishing he could stop, 
going hot and cold like a man with a fever. Sheftu had chosen his spot well. The lane was deserted, closed in by buildings that would remain dark and empty until morning. There would be no one to disturb them. Walk casually to meet her, murmured Sheftu. He strolled forward and Nakonk trailed after him, wiping his sweaty palms on his thighs. Presently, Mara drew close enough to catch sight of them, and he could hear her sharp little intake of breath as she halted. An instant later, she recognized them. Sheftu, her voice was low, but it held only surprise and pleasure, no fear. She moved swiftly to join them, looking from one to the other in amusement. What is this, I pray? An ambush? One might call it so, answered Sheftu silkily. Come, I want a word with you. He took her arm and guided her to a recessed doorway, while Nikon drifted a little apart where he could watch both ends of the alley. He could hear Mara's uneasy little laugh. How about the words you wish, but why choose this place? At the inn, we could... You'll not be going to the inn tonight. Why will I not? She hesitated, and her tone changed. Sheftu, you're acting strange. Is aught amiss? Aye, much is amiss. The, the vessel Friend of the Wind was raided tonight by the Queen's soldiers. She gave a gasp Nakant could have sworn was genuine. Oh, Cyrus... With all the gold on her, aboard her? Aye, when you travel to the shores of the night to bring it back. Nay, they can't, they mustn't. Those, her voice broke with fury, and for a moment her language reeked of Menfi's waterfront. But shall we do not but wail for it? For for love of Ammon, we must do something. You must do something, Sheftu, you're the leader. Aye, a brilliant leader. Sheftu's voice remained quiet, but... The whiplash Nakonk had been dreading came into it now. I've saved Egypt with one hand and destroyed her with the other by trusting a maid as faithless as the wind. Mother of the gods, whispered Mara. You think I did it? My lovely Mara no doubt exists, but I didn't do it. I didn't. I didn't. There must have been another who listened. I didn't do it, Sheftu, the juggler. Aye, that's who it was. He was there, Asnakonk. He heard everything. It was that babbling Saur. May the devourer take him. I knew he'd betray us before we'd done with him. Did I not tell you, warn you? I was certain you would place the blame elsewhere. Ask Sheftu, you're blind. You've ever been blind about that rogue. And look you now. All the gold is gone. The plan's ruined, Mara, said Sheftu softly. There was no gold on that ship. There was a sudden silence. Nikonk edged toward them without knowing what he did. He was beginning to feel as if he could not breathe. Suppose it were Saur. It could have been. It was possible, even probable, and by all the gods. Stay away from her, Captain, ordered Sheftu. Mara drew a soft, irregular breath. Why, she whispered, should the captain stay away from me? Because he has revealed an unfortunate weakness where you're concerned, said Sheftu, moving closer to her. For the first time, he was failing to hide the strain he was under. Nikon could see the tension in his shoulders, and his voice had grown harsh and thick. This affair is between you and me little one. Do you understand? Let me make it quite clear to you. There was no gold on the ship, nor was it our ship. The news was false. It was a trap, Mara, and you walked into it. Sheftu, I did not betray you. I swear by my call. Ask, be silent. I know all about you. All. I know you're a slave in the queen's pay, and have been since you took the ship with us in Menfi. I know you lied to me then, and have lied to me every day I've known you, and would go on lying until the end of time if it would get you what you want. Your master believed you, didn't he? I know of that too. How cleverly you've played both sides, waiting, holding back until last night you thought you'd chosen certain victory. 
Mara was slowly, almost imperceptibly backing away from him. Though she seemed scarcely to move or even breathe, suddenly she whirled to run. Just as suddenly, Sheftu's hand shot out and seized her wrist. In a flash, he had doubled her arm behind her back, jerked her close to him. He held a gleaming knife in his other hand. Not this time, little one, he said softly. His rough handling had caused the cloak to fall away from her hair, and the fragrance of lotuses now drifted through the alley. Nikonk flattened stiffly against the building opposite, tried to look away and couldn't. His eyes were fastened on the knife blade, and he became gradually aware that it was trembling. How have you kept him satisfied, I wonder, whispered Sheftu, that master of yours, whoever he is. What have you told him? How much have you told him? Mara, too, was staring at the knife, shrinking away from it as far as his grip would let her. Chef, too, she breathed. You can't do it. You can't. Ah, uh, uh, can I not? Who will ever know or care? She looked up at him suddenly, and then Nakonk witnessed a very strange thing. Instead of shrinking from the knife, she flung herself close against Sheftu, twined her free arm about his neck, and kissed him on the mouth. What happened next was never clear in Nakonk's mind. He was aware of a strangled oath from Sheftu, the clatter of the knife hitting the gravel, and felt Mara hurtle against him as if she had been thrown. Instinctively, Nakonk wrapped his arms about her and whirled so that his own body shielded hers. Take her, Captain, gasped a voice that might have been Lord Sheftu's. Take her out of Thebes, out of Egypt, anywhere, but let me never see her again. Hasty footsteps plunged away up the alley, pounded around a corner, and were gone. When Nakonk's head cleared a little, he found that he was cursing steadily and idiotically under his breath still clutching Mara tight in his arms. He stopped, wet his shaking lips, and loosed his hold to peer down at her. She was weeping stormily. He did not know whether in anger or in fright. Is all well with you, little one? He murmured. He, he didn't harm you. She shook her head, burrowed harder against his chest, and continued to sob. He held her uneasily, patting her shoulder now and then, and growing vague, growling vague comfort under his breath. He was not used to weeping maidens and had no idea what, what one did for them, but he felt dimly that it would be best to let her weep her fill. Presently, the storm subsided a little, and after a moment, she stirred and lifted her head. Nakonk, where is he? Gone, little one. Likely halfway to the falcon by this time. He'll go there? Aye, I think so. He'll want to make sure all's well, and besides, besides what? Well, little one, said Nakonk roughly, I think he'll be warning them about you. Ordering them to murder me on sight, I'll wager, she burst out. Just on the chance you'll not take me far enough to the ends of the earth, I just on the chance, just on the chance, he soothed. But we'll not founder on that sandbar till we hit it. I must take you away, little one. You know that, don't you? He stirred fretfully again. She stirred fretfully against him, and he dropped his arm, studying her profile in the gloom. Look, you made. How much of that was true? What he accused you of? Oh, her hand had wandered to the uh, crushed lotus in her hair. She pulled it out, looked at it a moment, then dropped it to the ground. All of it, Nakonk. Save about the ship, Saur told that. He must have, because I never did. I never meant to. I swear, I've told not. She broke off, seemed to hold her breath a moment. At least not much, she suddenly went on. As for the rest, can I be blamed for that? I didn't ask to be sold, mother of truth. It was a chance to be free, perhaps rich. What did I know about the king then? I'd not even met Sheftu. Once I did, then I wished I'd never seen that cursed master of mine. But Nakonk, I've told him not that matters. I've but played hounds and jackals with him. I had to do that, didn't I? If I didn't, if I'd not done it, he'd have thrown me back into the gutter. Aye, she's just a child, Nakonk was thinking. A little waif. 
in a cursed, ugly world, and none to be befriend her. No matter, it's past now, he muttered, patted her awkwardly. We'll have a fine voyage. Clean to Crete, if you like. Crete a good land, with one uh, little one, an island. A mite odd and foreign, but pleasant, and uh, lively enough even for you. They've acrobats there, men and maids both, who dance about under the horns of the bull and leap over their backs so that you'll never seen the like. You'll be no slave either, and I'll wager you could sell that ring of yours for a hundred gold debon. Aye, come, little blue eye, Crete's the place. Let's be out of this dark alley. You're good to me, Nikon, whispered Mara, and I'll come, but she hesitated, resisting when he tried to draw her forward. What's amiss now, maid? Nikonk, how do we know he's gone? He, he might be waiting just yonder around the corner, or he might have changed his mind and come back. Nay, nay, don't worry, he's gone. Aye, how can you be sure? Now then, if it'll ease your mind, I'll make certain of it. Come, stand in the doorway here. Uh, it'll take but a moment. Guiding her gently into the niche, the captain walked up the alley in the direction Sheftu had taken. He knew he would find no one. Her fears were needless, but he well understood them and meant to humor every one if it would help her. The winds had tossed her uh, craft enough, he thought belligerently, in her 17 short years. It was time somebody steered a straight course for her. As he had expected, the street beyond was quite deserted. He examined several dark nooks nearby so he could tell her he, he had done so then strode back into the alley. The first moonbeams were beginning to sift their way into it now. Out in the open on the river, it would soon be bright enough to navigate with fair accuracy. It would be a good night to sail, Nakonk decided, though it might not be wise to venture into those currents beyond the sandbar. They'd slip down a stream a few, they'd slip downstream a few miles and tie up until, the captain halted and frowned about him uncertainly. Was this not the doorway? He glanced back the way he had come, wondering if he'd misjudged the distance, decided perhaps he had, and started on. Then he stopped abruptly. There in the gravel at his feet, in the moonlight, glittered the, over the blade of a jeweled knife, and a cubit or two lay, uh, away lay a crumpled lotus. Mother of Ammon, he whispered the captain. The doorway was empty. The whole alley was empty, and that knife, or another, would likely be slicing his own throat before morning if he didn't find that slippery maid and bring her back. Mother of Ammon and Isis and Osiris and the sacred cat of Bast, he exploded. He scooped up the dagger, clamped his jaw at his fiercest, and started up the alley, running hard. So Mari gave him the slip. What do you think she's going to go do? She saved her own life from Sheftu. Sheftu loves her. Uh, he was going to kill her that night. He was going to because he is a fanatic about Egypt and about his pharaoh. But um, Mara kissed him and that, that brought it all back. He could not kill her. He could not do it. So he tossed her to Nakonk and said, get her out of here. Um, and then she uh, stayed. So she eluded uh, Nakonk. Why? What do you think she's going to go do? She's going to do something. She's not just going to go lay down somewhere. She's going to do something. So we'll see how this turns out. If Nahira, if he, if he gets a hold of Chef 2 first, or if, if, uh, if Mara does something to save people or rescue them, we don't know. So tune in tomorrow. Tune in to the next one. Guys, have a great day. We'll see you later. Enjoy.